Welcome to Beverly Unitarian Church Online Worship. My name is Jenny Cottrell. I am a worship associate, and I am so glad to welcome you to worship today. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation of children, youth, and adults of many races, religions, secular identities, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, educations, life experiences, and traditions. Here we celebrate a diversity of beliefs, striving always to make space for more. All of you are sacred, and all of you is sacred. You are welcome here. Whatever your past or present is like, we invite you to walk into the future with us. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, which are not doctrine or dogma, but rather our shared values and moral guide. To learn more about these principles, please visit the website of our denomination, www.uua.org. Our minister is the Reverend David Schwartz. Today, we are fortunate to have as our speaker, a member of BUC, Stacy Recht. We especially welcome visitors and hope you'll stay for the virtual coffee hour after the service on Zoom using the link that will be shared at the end of the service. We look forward to the day when we will be able to meet you in person. Although we remain distanced physically, we can stay connected. To get more involved, check out our Facebook page and our website. Contact the office to sign up for our monthly newsletter and weekly Friday email blast or to be connected to Reverend David for pastoral care. This is the season in the year when we as members of this church pledge our financial support for the daily work of the congregation. Each member is asked to give an amount that makes sense for them, unique to their own fi financial situation. It is our tradition to have a few members give a testimonial of what this church means to them and why they value it enough to make a financial investment in its work. This is the third of three testimonial videos in this series, and I now introduce Matt D'Agostino to share his thoughts. Hello all, my name is Matt D'Agostino and I was asked to talk briefly about why I support Beverly Unitarian Church. The last two years of my life have been a resurgence, a rebirth. Um, the church has given me a place to explore other people's views, to learn about the world, and to be an active participant in the world. Um, this church for me isn't something that is dogmatic. It's something that is a living faith. It's something that's a changing faith. And the more I'm able to support this church, the more I believe it will have the, the funding and the ability to support the causes that, that I believe in and the causes that I believe so many of us believe in. So I think the money that we can give to this group is money that is going to help the world be a place that we all would like to think that it can be. So I'm happy to give and to support and I hope that you can reach into your pockets and find anything that you feel like you can give we appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Stacy Recht, um, and I am a member of Beverly Unitarian Church. If you are also a member of our church or if you live in Beverly, um, you know exactly where I'm talking to you from today. This is the corner of 103rd and Longwood um, in the south side of Chicago, Beverly neighborhood. Way I want to acknowledge the Potawatomi people who, along with the Ojibwe and Odawa people, formed the Council of the Three Fires and signed the Treaty of Chicago in 1833. I'm acknowledging that we, that I right now, today, um, am sitting on Potawatomi land. I live on Potawatomi ancestral lands. This land 
where we have built our beautiful church and where I situate my home and family is stolen land. And it's stolen from people who didn't see land as property to own, sell, profit from, or steal. Instead, as Dr. Lau expressed to me, people see the land as a relative. He said in his interview with me, there's a reason our language refers to the earth as grandmother earth. The responsibility and understanding, the responsibility that comes in understanding that we are sitting on lands on ancestral homelands that the original first stewards consider so sacred and so personal is a responsibility to care for, steward, and hold close to our own hearts, the grandmother earth. who the Potawatomi so expertly stewarded before the apocalypse of European settler clothes. Our goal today is to offer context to a land acknowledgement, to learn from the first stewards who lived in, traveled across, and cared for this land, who burned the prairie and cultivated crops, made jokes, made art, made love, made war, built mounds from sacred earthen materials, built cities both small and seasonal and large and cosmopolitan, cultures with sophisticated, sustainable agricultural practices, democratic governmental structures, self-determinism, faith traditions, artistry, and healing practices. Millions of people speaking thousands of dialects of hundreds of languages across the many biomes of North America and South America formed unique cultures and histories, traded goods and technologies, practiced acts of compassion and cruelty and everything in between, and each and every individual lived every bit as complex, as nuanced, as unique, as social, as conflicted, as joyous, as pained, as humorous, as boring, as wondrous, as tragically brief a life as you or me. The vast majority of available historical accounts of first stewards concentrates on roughly 1.5% of the time of these tribes' existence, the catastrophic period of contact through removal. These histories cannot be told without the influence of the insatiability, injustice, and betrayal of settler expansionism. To learn only of their trauma and nothing of their triumphs is yet another erasure, another betrayal, but one we can begin to reconcile. The words for our chalice lighting today come from former Forest County Potawatomi Tribal Chairman, U.S. Army veteran and Potawatomi language educator, James Thunder. Today, we see what the people who have knowledge of coming events, our elders, were trying to tell us in the past. We were told to respect all living things, those that soar above us in the sky, those that walk or crawl upon the earth, those that belong underwater, all of the roots, trees, shrubs, grasses, and flowers. We were cautioned to take only what we need, for the Creator has set these upon Mother Earth for our use. Today we are abusing our Mother Earth. Our air, water, and soil is polluted. We are told not to eat fish out of certain streams and lakes. I pray to our Creator that we look back, that we may see ahead.
Friends, will you join me in the words of our covenant? Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Kajem Nadal Miigwech Kinnagago Mampi Gato Yinishka Kamekwing Mem de Gain and Bear Nangwan Miigwech Wendam on me Kinnan and Beach Mampi Tamagat Kichegamin Sagaganan Zebin Tikibin Mishkigak King Minwan Beach Nam Kamek Asna jena mosh nang kena goya wa jebejga wetoy yang ke nad mosh nang we wene ke chetwa wenda got nbe naganat to wenda na chimi gwach The Chicago Area Land Acknowledgements currently in circulation name tribes with significant activity, relationships, and commerce in our region. I speak to you today from the traditional homelands of the Potawatomi people whose vibrant culture, language, and history abide and grow. Specifically, I want to focus on the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi. Their tribal capital in southwest Michigan is two hours drive or train ride east of our castle. Along with the Prairie Band of Potawatomi, now in Kansas, the ancestors of today's Pokagon Band of Potawatomi lived on and cared for the land we call home today. And they are geographically the closest and the most connected to Chicago. Dr. John Lau's book, Imprints, The Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians in the City of Chicago, and the generosity of his time in collaborating with us has informed and guided us today. I've invited enrolled member of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and my neighbor and friend, Valerie Freeberg, to read a passage from his book. Indians did not vanish. Many resisted assimilation. Pokagon Potawatomi fought to retain their hard-won community and individual identities. American Indians across the country, indeed colonized people around the world, engaged in persistent and creative adaptations to avoid physical and social, political, and personal destruction. Pogagan Potawatomi experience represents an, an important and unstudied example of the ways in which American Indian people retain a presence in the urban centers of the United States despite efforts at removal, assimilation, and marginalization. The Pogagan Potawatomi not only maintain their residency in rural areas of southwest Michigan and northwest Indiana, but also retained a position in the city of Chicago, the great urban center of the United States built upon ancestral lands of the Potawatomi. Okay, now is the time in our service for this story for all ages. Today we're going to be reading the book We Are Water Protectors by Carol Lindstrom, illustrated by Michaela Goad. Hazel, can you say we are water protectors? We are water protectors. Written by Carol Lindstrom. Illustrated by Michelle Goad. Water is the first medicine Nokomis told me. It nourishes us inside our mother's body as it nourishes us here on Mother Earth. Water is sacred, she said. 
We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. The river's rhythm runs through my veins, runs through my people's veins. My people talk of a black snake that will destroy the land, spoil the water, poison the plants and animals, wreck everything in its path. When my people first spoke of the black snake, they foretold it wouldn't come for many, many years. Now the black snake is here. Its venom burns the land, courses through the water, making it unfit to drink. Take courage! I must keep the black snake away from my village's water. I must rally my people together. To stand for the water, to stand for the land, to stand as one against the black snake. It will not be easy. We fight for those who cannot fight for themselves, the wing ones, the crawling ones, the four-legged, the two-legged, the plants, trees, rivers, lakes. The earth. We are all related. Tears like waterfalls stream down, track my face, track down my people's faces. Water has its own spirit. Snoko must told me. Water is alive. Water remembers our ancestors who came before us. She said. We stand with our songs and our drums. We are still here. We are stewards of the earth. Our spirits have not been broken. We are water protectors. We stand. The black snake is in for the fight of its life. Every week, as we go throughout our lives, we experience both joy and sorrow. Every week, when we come back together in this worship space, we share those joys and sorrows with one another, so that the joys may be magnified and the sorrows made easier to bear. In just a moment, you'll be invited to enter into the chat any joys or sorrows you may wish to share with the congregation, so that we can hold you in our hearts. Remember that this is a public forum, and if there is a joy or sorrow that is too tender to speak aloud or to put into writing in the chat, just type "I I" as if you are raising two fingers silently, like we do in church, to have us acknowledge and hold your joy or sorrow in heart, mind, and prayer. Please enter your joys and sorrows now.
of the history of Native Americans that is available to us has been gathered primarily by researchers and academics of European descent and filtered through their viewpoints. They present what they consider important about Native American history, not what Native Americans consider important about their own history. So the Chicago area includes ancestral lands of 25 to 30 Native American nations. But by the time of the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, the land was primarily home to the Potawatomi Nation. You will hear reference to the Three Fires Confederacy or the Council of Three Fires. Well, this was a long-standing alliance dating back for over a thousand years. It had a very complex structure and operating system. There were three tribes involved in this alliance, and they are always listed in a specific order. First is the Ojibwe, or the, the Chippewa. And they are the older brother, the keepers of medicine. Then you have the Odawa or Ottawa, where the middle brother, the keepers of trade. And then the Potawatomi are the younger brother, the keepers of the fire. But it was really just the Potawatomi that actually lived here in the Chicago area in any great number. But they all signed the treaty because of the alliance. So let's talk a little bit about the Blue Island Ridge now. Um, we know that the Blue Island is a prehistoric landmass formed by glacier activity about 13,000 years ago. Now Blue Island and the surrounding land are part of the Calumet region at the southern end of Lake Michigan. In fact, uh, we're kind of the western boundary um, for the Calumet region. And it was actually the geography of this area that made it important for Native Americans and later for the European settlers. And that was for several reasons. First, there was abundant supply of fresh water in this area. And the area abounded with a natural diversity of plants and wildlife. Now, in addition to Lake Michigan, the systems of small lakes, Calumet and the Wolf, and the rivers and streams that are here on the south side, the Calumet River, Stony Creek, teemed with fish, trout, whitefish, pike, etc. And these waterways actually show us the second reason the area was so important. And that was because it was a strategic location for transportation and trade. The waterways in the seasonal wetlands offered portages, between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River to the west, and many overland trails also pass through the area. Geographers have identified seven major trails that ran through the Calumet region, and there were many smaller trails that, that have been lost. Some of these trails intersected right at the southern tip of the Blue Island, which is basically where Western Avenue crosses the Kalsag Channel. The Native Americans generally lived in villages along the Calumet waterways. A map from 1804 that was reproduced and updated in 1900 shows the early Native American trails and villages of the Chicago area and the surrounding counties. Um, Washington Heights and the Blue Island and Blue Island are delineated, and actually the Blue Island is outlined very nicely on this map. A close-up of that area shows, first of all, the vast wetlands that existed between the ridge and Lake Michigan. From here, east to the lake was almost primarily marshland and swamps. Number one uh, is at the northern tip of the ridge, Roughly 87th Street and Western Avenue. It shows an Indian camp and signal station were there. Now most of this land is now included in the Dan Ryan Forest Preserve of the Forest Preserves District of Cook County. But this was the highest elevation in the Chicago area, so it's not surprising that there would be some kind of 
signal or outlook station um, at that place. Uh, you could see for many miles around from that spot, you could see all the way to what is now downtown, which was about 12 miles to the northeast. Uh, back to the map, number two on the map is at the southern end of the Blue Island, just south of where Metro South Hospital is, probably around like Vermont um, Avenue to down to what was then the Stony Creek. That creek at that point is now part of the Calsac Channel. But there was a major, a ma really major Indian village there. Uh, there's also a circle which shows that there was an Indian mound there. Now, Indian mounds are usually burial sites. The mound builders were actually in the historic period before the Potawatomi. So this shows that that spot was probably an Indian site for a long time. There were other mounds in the Calumet area, but they were all destroyed for farms. Um, number three on the map shows a portage trail that went across the top of the ridge. This would have been an overland route to connect the waterways to the east to the Stony Creek. Uh, oh, I added a, a little yellow star there about where the castle is where the Beverly Unitarian Church is. That would have been right by the portage. The portage kind of came up and then ran across what is now 103rd Street. Number four on the map is very important because that's the Vincent's Trail. The Vincent's Trace or Trail uh, was a major trail originally formed by migrating buffalo that was well known and used by Native Americans and later by the European traders and settlers. It ran through Kentucky and Indiana and into Illinois. It was named the Vincennes Trail by white traders because a major location on the trail was Vincennes, Indiana, a city founded by French fur traders, a land inhabited for thousands of years by indigenous people. In Illinois, the trail ran south of the Blue Island Bridge, but a branch split off, heading north-south to from the area which became known as Chicago. Parts of that original trail became Chicago State Street and Vincent's Avenue. Now this branch that ran north-south to the Chicago area had two paths. One ran along the top of the bridge, and the second path ran on the east side below the bridge. There is a marker at 91st Street and South Pleasant Avenue that indicates the original path, now lost, that was on the top of the bridge. But the lower path eventually evolved um, into eventually evolved into today's Vincent's Avenue. Number five on the map is the Indian Boundary Line. Indian boundary lines were established in 1816. These defined territories that could be used by settlers and territory that could be used by the natives. The southern Indian boundary line is shown there. It was established running diagonally from the northeast to the southwest, passing just below the southern tip of the ridge. And so this made the ridge included in the settlers' territory and marking the land to the east for Native American use. Local histories, though, that we have at the Ridge Historical Society collection uh, include reports that early settlers found many Native American artifacts in the area. Post tolls were reported uh, being found in the 1840s at what is now the east side of Hale Avenue between 104th and 105th Streets, and stone tools were found in the area at that time, too. Just recently, thanks to Linda Lamberty, the RHS historian, um, I learned that in the history of Cook County, the history of Cook County, published by A.T. Andreas in 1884, 
there is this entry. The neighborhood of Washington Heights also claims some archaeological importance. Since 1859, the members of the Barnard family alone have collected 36 flint arrowheads, two battle axes, a spearhead, several pieces of ancient pottery, and other evidences of the former residence. The remnants of pottery were found in a small mound surrounded by large cobblestones and embraced, as it were, within the roots of a small oak tree which sprang up from the mound. The Native American sites are being excavated in undisclosed locations in a number of the forest preserves surrounding Chicago because that's about the only land left that hasn't been totally um, lost to development. So they, they are finding significant archaeological remains in the forest preserves. The presence of Native Americans in the Chicago area dwindled until the Indian Relo Relocation Act of 1956. The intent of that law was to encourage Native Americans to leave reservations and their traditional lands and assimilate into the general population in urban areas. The tribal status of numerous groups was terminated at that time, and much was done to try to eradicate Native American culture. The Chicago area was an obvious relocation city, um, supposedly offering employment, education, and housing opportunities. However, the Native Americans across the country quickly learned the opportunities were not there and faced much discrimination. The American Indian Center was founded in Chicago to provide social services and a gathering place for the people that were faced with really, you know, drastic life changes. Today, it's reported that 65,000 Native Americans and 175 different tribes are represented in the greater metropolitan area of Chicago. My question to Dr. Lau was how to make land acknowledgement statements relevant to today's Native Americans. Uh, what can we do to help Native American causes? So as far as the land acknowledgement statement goes for places connected to the ridge, we need to acknowledge the ancestral home of the Potawatomi and the presence of other tribes. Uh, we need to emphasize that Native Americans are part of the present and the future, not just the past. And of course, we need to support the issues important to Native Americans. Some of these include the U.S. government adhering to established treaties, um, protecting the lands that are now used by Native Americans, preserving a Native American culture. I'm Carol Flynn, a historian and writer with the Rich Historical Society. Although my presentation and opinions here today are my own, they are not officially representative of RHS. Human beings have such a profound ecocultural impact on our earth that scientists have identified a direct correlation between the number of languages and dialects spoken in a region and the level of floral and faunal biodiversity. It's challenging to me to imagine a more harrowing statistical correlation and yet I'm entranced by the combined cultural and ecological possibilities. From the Yale article linking twin extinctions of species and languages. Put simply, there are more human languages where there are more species. Nearly 60% of the languages in high biodiversity regions like Amazonia and the lowland forests of West Africa are spoken by fewer than 10,000 people and some fewer than 1,000. Nishinaabemowin, the language of the Potawatomi, has four native speakers. How did that happen? A thousand cuts made by one sharp knife. Family separation, boarding schools, prohibition of teaching native languages and reservations, 
forced assimilation, cultural erasure, the separation of people from their land and from one another, dwindling populations, absent opportunities, the dominant culture's lack of respect for indigeneity. The Native American Languages Act of 1990 protected the rights of Native Americans to use their own languages. 1990. By then it was almost too late to save many languages. Carla Collins is a member of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and spent four years immersed in language with three of the now four living elders who learned Anishinaabemowin before they learned English. You know, it's valuable to us mm -hmm. because after our last fluent speaker dies, then how are how is anybody from the next generation going to understand what their perspective on life was? Like you hear Miigwech all the time. Mm -hmm. In Potawatomi, that kind of means like, okay, that's enough, right? So if somebody's pouring you a cup of coffee, and you want half a cup, and once they hit that half, you say, oh, me quetch, like that's enough. That's what we use for modern day thank you, because now we need a word for thank you, or else we looked at like we're being rude or ungrateful. Was we didn't have to thank people for doing things for us because everybody just did things for each other. And we didn't have to say please, because please is like a, it's like a form of begging. But now it just is a form of being polite. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have to say please because we didn't, if we needed something, we just said what we needed and somebody helped. And it was, you know, communities that helped each other. Well, that stuff, when we lose the language, we kind of lose that perspective. That dies when that speaker dies. And... Robin Wall Kimmerer, citizen Potawatomi Nation member botanist, poet, and author of the bestseller Breeding Sweetgrass, writes beautifully about her work to learn the language of her ancestors and spoke to Krista Tippett for the program on being. In, in Potawatomi, the cases there we have are animate and inanimate, and it is impossible in our language to speak of other living beings as it. The language of it, which distances, disrespects, and objectifies, I can't help but think is at the root of a, a worldview that allows us to exploit nature. Oh. And I've been thinking about the word aki in our language, which refers to land. And the, there's a beautiful word, bemadizi aki, which one of my elders kindly shared with me. It means a living being of the earth. To speak the language in even the tiniest amount so that it's almost as if I, it feels like the, you know, the air is waiting to hear this language that had been hmm. lost hmm. For, for so long. Our silent meditation, some of our readings and songs come primarily from the three tribes who make up the three fires, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi with some voices from Oneida, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk as well. May we also embrace the cultural diversity that is biodiversity's necessary corollary. Let us learn about, celebrate, and appreciate, and create space for Earth's vibrant, majestic morality. Give me one, 
Vinagame nibi Ho chonkwa onche Chonke jani shonche Mas jani shonche Ninapi Mama chetta asawean Keme wan, catch keme wan, me now I will nebu. Nishna be ndao, keme ya, che keme ya, me nok me bish. Ongwe hoe ni i lo gano lo lo gano lacy yo yano le une canus anishina be nindao gimme one chickimme one minagame Chankwa unje, chanke jani junje, mas jani junje, ni na pi. Mama chetta asawe an, keme wan, catch keme wan, me na awe. Uh, so my name's Kyle White, and I'm a professor at Michigan State University. I work in two departments, and the Department of Philosophy and the Department of Community Sustainability, and I'm part of our American Indian and Indigenous Studies program. Uh, I'm a Potawatomi tribal member, and I'm enrolled in the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, which is in uh, Oklahoma. It would have been an act of imagining dystopia for our ancestors to consider the erasures we live through today, writes Kyle White in his essay, Our Ancestors' Dystopia Now. This scholarly and philosophical work and its more recent companion essay, Indigenous Science Fiction for the Anthropocene, are dense and replete with epiphany, research, and creativity. In a recent public conversation held by the Newberry Library, Blair Topush Caldwell and Shannon Speed discussed his ideas and led me to his work. Their voices are included as well. I wish to present seven concepts White's writing has left me with. Number one, the apocalypse we dread has already happened. Failing to recognize this is indigenous erasure that indigenous communities have already lived through the apocalypse. The fears and anxieties of mainstream society about climate change, disease, resource depletion, species extinction are already part of indigenous people's lived experience, not just our history, but we're still living through it. Two, settler capitalism tells the lie that collapse is inevitable. Because our culture sees time and capitalist progress as inevitable and linear, we are ill-equipped to imagine, much less construct, a better way through the same system that brought us to this moment. But what I think is most important for us to grasp is that while this doesn't look new to us as Native peoples, um, what is different about the current moment of crisis is that now it is white peoples indeed all people's lives that are in jeopardy. The fact that the crisis is that widespread and that out of control also may mean that this crisis is the moment where power relations can be shifted and structures toppled. In that moment, we as Native peoples and as Native studies scholars have contributions to make, both to contest the victim narratives of crisis research and provide alternative perspectives, as well as to highlight the processes by which and through which the crises that we face are products 
inevitable products of settler capitalism and to provide alternative visions for the world. Number three. But time, however, is a nonlinear spiral. Anishinaabe cultures, on the other hand, view time as more of a spiral, with pasts and presents close at hand and in conversation, even consultation. Um, one thing that this present as the future of the past signals is a difference in the way Native peoples think about time in general, in this apocalyptic moment in particular. Um, that is, that I mean, in many Native cultures, we tend to understand past, present, and future in nonlinear ways. Um, this brings a radically different vision to approaching this crisis, quite distinct, um, as Kyle's piece highlights um, from say, studies of the Anthropocene. Um, and it challenges the conventional wisdom that's part of Western ideology regarding the ostensibly inevitable kind of evolutionary progression of history from the onset of settler capitalism and colonialism to the present moment. Number four, through dialogue with our ancestors and descendants, we can imagine other futures. The Nishnabimoan word, Yankab Jagan, means both great-grandparent or great-grandchild. Being in dialogue with one's Yakub Jagan introduces problem-solving possibilities that acknowledge a greater depth of cause and effect and allowing the invention of alternative futures, disrupting an anthropocenic inevitability. White writes, The spiraling narratives unfold through our interacting with our ancestors and our descendants. They unfold as continuous dialogues as we move from being descendants to ancestors through our own lives. These conversations can become more confrontational for those of us whose ancestors were themselves colonizers or who enacted or enabled oppression. What kinds of conversations should the descendants of oppressive ancestors have? I imagine this might be something like, the world you wanted for us meant the end of the world for many others. And so we have a responsibility to rebuild those destroyed worlds for all of our great grandchildren. We inherited from you a racist, earth-rupturing system, but we can and will choose a different inheritance for the next generation. These narratives allow us to determine protagonists who can lead these alternative futures. White writes, Our ancestors and future generations are rooting for us to find and empower protagonists that can help us survive the post-apocalypse. And there is quite a bit of creativity involved in figuring out who the protagonist will be. The literature on indigenous science fiction discusses the range of protagonists that indigenous authors introduce in their narratives, from non-humans, to spirits, to women, to youth. Number six, allies have to get it right in this generation. As allies, it is incumbent upon us to acknowledge our role in the current moment as we grasp for solutions. Many of the ancestors of today's allies designed the worlds we live in today to fulfill their fantasies of the future. Today's worlds, such as those of U.S. settler colonialism in North America, were constructed to provide privileges to their descendants. They were gifts of a troubling sort. One privilege is exactly that power to dominate and inhabit indigenous lands and come to believe that it is legally and morally acceptable to do so. Number seven, we can live alternative, better futures by centering indigenous peoples, stories, and practices. Storytelling in deep relationship with all beings, human and non-human, past and present, and future, can connect us to indigenous knowledge of survival and response to climate change. We have, through these relationships, an opportunity to get it right at last. Yankob Jagan, 
our great-grandchildren and great-grandparents can help us find our way. We just have to ask, what kind of a world do they want to see? Way Citizen Band of Potawatomi member and singer-songwriter Alexa Dawson wrote this song following a trip to visit with the Pokagon Band Potawatomi. She writes about that trip. As I left that place, I was overwhelmed with gratitude at how welcomed I had been made to feel. It hit me that no good relationship is a threat to another. Everyone can belong in the circle because the circles just keep widening and overlapping. And this is how the good work is going to get done. You belong in the circle. You belong, you belong. You belong in the circle. You belong, you belong. Not above, not below, in the circle you belong. You were born in the circle, you belong, you belong. You were born in the circle, you belong, you belong. Not above. circle you belong all of life is a circle you belong you belong all of life is a circle you belong you belong not above not below in the circle There is love in the circle, we belong, we belong. We have peace in the circle, we belong, we belong. Not above, not below, in the circle, we belong. Not above, not below. I don't believe that this acknowledgement is uh, one of finality. I believe that it's rather the beginning of the beginning. Now that we have the questions, we can start to work on the answers together. Land Acknowledgement In recent years, it has become a trend to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the indigenous peoples of a particular area through a land acknowledgement. This type of activity is designed to bring more awareness and understanding of the history of indigenous peoples and their territories. But a land acknowledgement should also be more than that. It should be a call to rethink one's own relationship with the environment and the histories of all peoples. In partnership, the American Indian Center, and the Beverly Unitarian Church have crafted the following land acknowledgement to help rethink their relationships with the city, the land, and the environment. Beverly Unitarian Church sits on the traditional homelands of the ancestors of the sea he filed. The Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Odawa nations who cared for and stewarded this land and signed the Treaty of Chicago. Other tribes, including the Sac, Fox, Ho-Chunk, 
Miami, uh, Menominee, Kickapoo, Oto, Missouri, Illinois Confederacy, Kaskaskia, and Peoria Peoples Managed Relationship with this area. Today, Chicago continues to be a place that calls many people from diverse backgrounds to live and gather. Despite the many changes the city has experienced, both our American Indian and Beverly Unitarian Church community see the importance of the land and this place that has always been a city home to many diverse backgrounds and perspectives. Our words for extinguishing the chalice are also from James Thunder. Let us examine our lives so that we are respectful to our fellow humans and to nature. Let us respect our children and above all, let us live our lives in accordance with our beliefs. Let us share our natural resources for the good of our people. Let us work for clean air and water and pray for the courage to stand up to those who would abuse our Mother Earth. Tatha ge nam ge, so be it.